One of the strategies that I want to share with you, um, I, I, I just really began to think about this week. I had the privilege of going for the first time in my life to a marathon. Your friend was running in a marathon and I was so thrilled for her. And so um, I, I walked up uh, to crowds of people who were standing on the sideline and I saw something that moved me to the core. I saw complete strangers cheering for women and men they didn't know. I saw folks bring their babies and make signs and scream and yell. I heard people call out names of women they didn't know who were running, go Amanda, you're cleaning up here, honey. I heard people speak to complete strangers and tell them lies, saying, you're looking good, Anna. <laughs> Anna wasn't looking good. Anna was whipped, but it was a great lie because it made Anna run to the next mile. I watched with eager anticipation for my own friend to come and she was at the end of the first large throng of runners and I saw her in a distance. I had taped her name to the front of the shirt she was going to wear so I knew her when I saw her and she was looking good at nine miles, looking good. And I cheered for my friend and she stopped momentarily to give me a little hug and a pat and told me she was doing fine and then I met her again at the 20th mile. I saw my friend from a distance because her name was still on her shirt. And now she wasn't running and she wasn't sprinting and she wasn't even jogging. She was walking and her shoulders were slumping and sweat had saturated her hair and her entire outfit. And I saw her from a distance and her mom and her sister and I were there together and we began to yell and scream her name. And as we called her name, she looked up and we all had a shirt with her face on it. And so we flashed her and showed her her own beautiful face. We had a sign with her name as we began yelling and screaming. She lifted her head and straightened her body and began to run. The first thing I want to tell you that's going to help you in this long haul is if you make a commitment and a practice to speak life to one another. Not the pleasantries, but bold, fierce affirmation. When somebody you're working with has a blog, read it and tell her how brilliant she is, how critical her thought is, how vital her voice is. If one of your sisters running a fund has a brand new website, go on the site and tell her it's spectacular. When somebody gets a new job, slip her a note and tell her how much it means. Your words to one another will give life to each other and it'll mean the difference between walking and making it to the end of the race. Before I move, I'd like you to say to someone next to me, your leadership is transforming the world. <laughs> tell her women and girls are better because of your work. All right, come on, I only have a few more minutes. The Dallas Cowboys knew something a long time ago that we're just figuring out in the women's movement, but that's that every activist needs a cheerleader. <laughs> Let's learn to cheer for one another. Deborah, can you, I trouble you for a little bit of water, I'm almost done. All right, my second suggestion, you know I'm an ordained minister, and so it comes from, thank you, Helen, comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. It's a wonderful story about a bold prophet named Elijah who's bold until he encounters a bolder, badder queen whose name is Jezebel. <laughs> Jezebel says, by tomorrow, boy, you'll be dead. Elijah is so nervous and afraid of Jezebel that the scripture says he runs and runs to um, a, a city called Beersheba, and he falls fast asleep under a broom tree. And in his slumber, God sends a heavenly messenger from heaven who visits him. So this is the second instruction for us. The angel visits and says, to, and wakes him up and says, and has prepared for him a cake and prepared for him a jar of water. And the angel says, Elijah, wake up. Arise and eat, because the journey before you is very great. Elijah eats the cake and drinks the water, and then falls back asleep. And the angel visits a second time and tells him what your diet manager is telling you not to do. Arise and eat, <laughs> because the journey before you is long and great. Elijah wakes up the second time and eats again, realizing that he's got a long way to go, miles to go, before he sleeps. I want to encourage you while you're here in Denver to eat. <laughs> Not just food, but for you to take in the stories of sisters who have done incredible things in their communities, on their continents, in their countries. I want to encourage you to consume 
stories of success and the wisdom of sisters who are near you. I want to encourage you to digest the company and the good favor of women who care about your welfare and want to see you succeed. I want to tell you what the angel told Elijah. While you're here, be sure to eat. Don't diet. Don't fast. Take it all in. The third thing I want to encourage you to do is something that I learned firsthand. Do I just have two more minutes left? Okay. All right. Um, I had the privilege of traveling to Ghana a few years ago with um, a couple of wonderful funders for the West African Women's Forum. And so, so the forum was terrific, and, and while we were there, uh, we made a determination that our travel, our travel there had been so long that we were all getting a huge treat, which was going to be that we could ride business class. So I'm a colored girl from Cleveland, and I remember taking the Greyhound bus. So I was thrilled about the thought of being in business class, and so everything was wonderful until we got to the check-in desk in Ghana, where the smug ticket counter agent checked all of my colleagues in, and when it was time for me to be checked in, all of them were in business class and I was in coach. Um, and no, no amount of begging or cajoling or bribing would make brother let me sit in the front. Um, I was disappointed, and so I sat in the back. I sat uh, one row up from the restroom, um, next to a woman who spoke only French who didn't know how to fasten her seatbelt, right behind a couple who had twin 18-month-olds, <laughs> who were just enjoying the whole space of the plane, stopping back and forth, screaming and laughing with each other. I sat across from a man who was about 103, who was sure that he was my long-awaited husband. <laughs> and he was going to wrap up the courtship by the time we landed. <laughs> I had only one thing going for me on that flight, friends. And that was someone who was on our trip with us. Um, Gloria Steinem happened to be there, and she approached a young, stu or young flight attendant and said to her, listen, my friend, by just a sheer accident, it, uh, wasn't seated with us, but we meant for her to be seated with us. Is there a way that you could move her to the front? And the young flight attendant said, no, ma'am, I don't think so. But she said, well, will you ask your supervisor? And so she, she went over to her supervisor, and the supervisor said, who asked you about moving someone forward? She said, that woman over there in the glasses. You know those glasses. <laughs> and so when, when the older flight attendant, the supervisor, looked to see who it was, she said to her young colleague, her young protege, do you know who that is? And the young woman said, no, I don't. I just know she wants to move a friend from the very back of the plane to the very front of the plane. She said, that woman is Gloria Steinem. You would be a stewardess today if Gloria Steinem didn't march with us in the 60s and 70s. We would be bearing, wearing short skirts and we wouldn't have a job unless we were single and we would be fondled and padded and treated like meat by the men in first class if that woman didn't write and advocate and stand with us. Whoever her friend is, go back and get her. <laughs> what I wanna tell you today is that the colored girl went from the back of the plane to the front with great relish because someone who had a voice and power leveraged her voice and power and her impact for me. So I want to tell you, those of you who have influence, recommend to a search committee or to a board a sharp lesbian who knows the issues. Don't deny her because of her sexual orientation. I want to tell you that if you know a brilliant, differently abled woman who's a gifted orator, orator recommend her for a promotion. Speak to your friends on the board about the black woman who won't get a chance if you don't give it to her. Give the young woman with the pierced nose an opportunity to show you what she can do. Her nose is pierced and yours isn't, but wait till she lends her skill set and her gifts to the organization. It will be a place that you don't even recognize. I finally want to tell you that, um, that our, as, as we think and, and honor Dorothy Height today, she said something that moved me as I close, and she said that when she met with Mary McLeod Bethune early in her career, Mary McLeod Bethune talked to her about what women have to do in order to reach our goal of combating injustice. And she took both of her hands, and will you do that with me? And she enmeshed her fingers together, and she formed a, fi a tight fist, and she told her young protege, if women don't join together intimately and collaboratively, we will never win this race. I wanna tell you today that we can win it 
if we'll stay in it together. Blessings to you. <laughs>